And I think we all have uh, our heads filled with new thoughts, probably. And uh, as you've heard, I'm the moderator of the conversation that will follow now, and I hope you will all stay also afterwards for some minutes. And uh, while the panelists are taking their seats, I have the, the pleasure to say welcome to Robert Stone, the director of this movie. Introduce yourself. 
Okay, um, my name is Neil Powell. Um, I work at the Centre for Sustainable Development, which is a centre that straddles both um, Uppsala University and um, the University of Agri Agricultural Sciences. Um, do, you, do you want me to give you a, give an impression of the movie now? Or give you yes, answer? please, why not? Just to uh, give you a short impression of the movie. Very briefly, and we'll get back to deeper questions afterwards. Okay, well, I mean, I, I have a, a sort of longer impression of the movie, but I won't give that now. Um, I think it centres very much about around being an environmentalist. Um, I think you yourself, in your introduction, introduced yourself as an environmentalist. Um, and very much of the discussions are around climate change, I think, and carbon emissions. I, I, think, I think we're probably more than environmentalists. And, um, that's certainly what the Centre for Sustainable Development is going to offer. It's going to offer a humanist perspective as well when we um, perhaps deconstruct some of your arguments in the movie. But I, I thought it was very interesting, very provoking. Thank you for it. And uh, you'll hear a bit more from me in a minute, I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I am Justin Nielsen. I'm a professor in chemistry here at the Amsterdam Laboratory. And my research is based on the batteries, new batteries battery materials for the future. And I'm also coordinating a big uh, energy initiative called Stand Up for Energy, which is supported by the government as a strategic research environment. And it's about renewable electricity production, the smart grid, and new automotives based on uh, EVs and uh, electric vehicles, and HEVs. And it's together with KKH and the agriculture universities. We also span over several universities and really stand up stands for Stockholm and Uppsala. And my impression was that yes, I agree with you. It, it was sort of uh, discussing the environmental movement, but it's also shown the complexity of the, our global energy system. It's not simple. And, uh, and, and of course, how that will affect us as human beings, I think it's a really important discussion. And the more I, I learn about it, the more complex I think it is, because it has to do also with resources. And it has to do with human behaviors. Do we always take rational decisions? So in our stand up for energy, it's not only about technology, it's also about energy systems perspectives, uh, uh, bringing in psychologists, governmental scientists, economic, economists, and so on, because this is important for our future. And you should know that the amount of research money for the OECD countries were decreasing from 1970 up to 2008. It has decreased and decreased and decreased. Uh, from 2008, it has gone up a little bit again. So this is important. Thank you. And uh, you, you want? Yes, so my name is Johan Jadegu. I'm a PhD in environmental history at Royal Institute of Technology and I'm a former student of Uppsala University at which I got my bachelor and master's degree. Um, I've also been involved in pedagogical projects and uh, developing the curriculum of uh, higher education primarily in Uppsala. Um, I watched this movie uh, last night, well actually in the morning in my bed. Um, <laughs> good way to uh, loiter your uh, sheets, so to speak, uh, at least about the <clears throat> more appalling parts of it and, and the actual crisis uh, which our en energy consumption um, poses for societies globally. But my impression of the movie was actually more about the point which he makes, um, Robert, about that the climate movement is not necessarily the same as the environmental movement. There's a diversification here. and is in no way a uh, monolithic or homogeneous um, solidarity between those causes that you can have a conservative stand or, or a very much a progressive or radical stand if you're pro-technology to solve the problems or if it's a more skeptical one, uh, which I hope that we can get back to. And actually, the question as to whether one can not be an environmentalist in a time when humanity itself has become a geological force, uh, changing uh, the very shape of our climate. So, just a brief point. Hello, um, my name is Carl Hennesen, and I'm a researcher here at Uppsala University in uh, applied nuclear physics. And I'm here to answer any questions, maybe about technological questions about nuclear power and future nuclear power in particular. 
And um, I could say that I'm very happy about this movie. Um, and not only because it covers a topic in which I work, but also because it lifts the energy question to the global plane, which is where I think it belongs. Because when energy is debated here in Sweden, it's almost always about how many terawatt hours of wind power can we introduce into our system? Is it 10 terawatt hours, or 30 terawatt hours, or something like that? And we also discuss endlessly about if we can increase our energy efficiency, we wouldn't need nuclear power in Sweden. And that might be true. But at the same time, there are billions of people around the world who have no or virtually no access to electricity. And also, there are two billion people, not yet born, but who will be by the mid-century. So, these people can, of course, not meet their energy needs with energy efficiency. So, we will have to produce a lot more energy over the coming decades. That, I think... Um, and I think this is kind of beautifully illustrated in your movie with this globe spinning around, where you can see continents lighting up. And uh, that energy has to be provided somehow. And I think this movie is an excellent point to start discussing how that energy should be produced. So, my compliments. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is the panel. And here are you. And if you feel that you are almost falling asleep by now, uh, we have a question for you to wake you up. You all received clickers when you entered. And uh, now is the time for the first question. Who wants to run this <laughs> Here is the first question. A documentary film often has an agenda. Is it justified to show such a film at university? Yes or no? The following is open. And we have 100 responses, 110, 20, 130. You are allowed to change your, you, you can press twice and change your, your vote. Does anybody think this film should not have been shown at this university? <laughs> <laughs> so the polling is now the open, and I think we have a verdict. Most of the people who came here actually wanted to see this movie at the university. <laughs> okay, so uh, after you work up a bit, now we will turn to Johan and give you the first question, and then I hope after Ivan's answer that all of you in the panel uh, have maybe have comments. So, first question. How do you communicate technical uh, difficult topics to a general public? And what are the challenges, and is it harder when it's politically sensitive, and how do you deal with that? Well, um, it's interesting about these polls actually, because it, what it might show is that the students actually all the time watch movies during lectures. Uh, but let's assume it's during the lecture promoted by the teacher themselves. I don't find this particularly um, problematic or even radical actually. Um, I mean, economics and science are never one sided. Um, and I would actually want to return to the discussion of agenda in a general sense of the higher education curriculum. Because what we're being discussed here, um, your question from the beginning, Anna, was about the general public. And I would actually want to reframe this question to higher education because I think that's more suitable for this audience. Um, the political risks of climate change is essentially about fear, I think. Uh, in this movie, we will discuss the consequences of nuclear power and indeed the consequences of not using nuclear power. And both those touch upon um, the aspect of fear. What would happen if we would not go over to uh, a nuclear power industry and production uh, to phase out other types of fossil fuels? Uh, could we live with those types of consequences in a global sense? Um, and I think that's a pedagogical question because it's deeply empirical. Uh, we can know about how similar 
uh, process have occurred in history. Um, and that's one of the re chief reasons why I'm into environmental history. And if we take Chernobyl as an example, which is one of your key aspects also in this movie, Chernobyl needs to be dis considered within a larger framework, which is the systematic crisis of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. We cannot take out that component, so nuclear power within the Soviet system is then part of a general crisis. That is the political ambitions involved, and the society using that power. So the fact that it did not have the um, required security um, measures is not that important. What is important is the fact that the society in general did not function or did not have incentives to function. Um, if we go even further back, we would discuss how one would su survive a nuclear war, for instance. In the US, we have several political scientists um, arguing that uh, nuclear war is not that problematic because we have shelters which we can hide in or, or try to survive the thermonuclear winter uh, falling upon it. So what happens is that when you let fear guide your communication and research, you end up assu assuming or accepting the current technological uh, and political order. Uh, in the 1950s, you assumed that the Cold War would keep on going. You assumed that there would be two superpowers eventually annihilating one another. And today, we assume that the current consumption will continue. There are good reasons for our assumptions today that we will not have less energy consumption in the future. But still, we must see that we have those assumptions when we make the prediction and indeed argue for the case that we need more power, um, powered by nuclear energy rather than any other. So, how do we then organize higher education on nuclear power? Well, um, I think that Pandora's promise, the argument that it makes, uh, is that we need to debate these things. Uh, we need to debate, in, in general, the agenda um, involved in our education. Um, and I think that the fact that we are here today is one good reason that we have succeeded to some degree in that. Uh, but why should we stop by, by having a discussion of whether a movie is uh, problematic or not? Um, I think actually we should be discussing as how we, uh, as to have how we educate our uh, en nuclear engineers. Uh, and you don't need well cut scenes, you don't need a choice of data to graph, you don't, you don't need good allegories to Greek mythology uh, or a soundtrack to have uh, an education which is guided by an agenda. All those things are already uh, present in our textbooks, say perhaps the soundtrack. So, <laughs> uh, Can I just pipe in about the public communication thing? Because this was the key, the key yeah. challenge for me in making a film about climate and energy and human development, which are inherently sort of dry subjects. And you know, most films about climate change that I've seen, I, I walk out and I want to slip my wrists. Uh, this was a challenge for me to tell this story in a way that was a compelling human story. Um, so finding, finding characters who very much mirrored my own you know, personal evolution on this whole thing was a key to telling a story and having a, having a sort of a key personal narrative. Um, but um, you're, are you waving at me? No, I call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Um, so yeah, I, I, I actually believe that, I, I know that nuclear is still a, a very problematic thing for a great many people, and it's still highly controversial. So controversial that the question that you first asked would even be asked. Like the fact that the, that question is even asked is indicative of, of the problem that we face. And I'm glad that we got the reaction that we did to it. You know, the, 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 the question, should we even have this conversation? Like, of course we should have this conversation. And we should have this conversation. We can't have this conversation at a university. Where can you have it? Um, but if you want to look to an example of how quickly societies can change their minds about deeply contentious issues, uh, one example has happened very recently in my country, the United States. The, the issue of gay marriage has, has and, and gay rights has flipped completely in a very, very short period of time. Um, 
primarily by people, because uh, so many people who were gay came out of the closet and exposed themselves and they are here. Suddenly everybody's like, oh, they're everywhere. They're my kids, they're my friends, they're my neighbors. And it became a non-issue because it was out and people were talking about it, it was discussed, it was just a part of normal life. And I think if, if uh, people, those people who work in nuclear uh, are, are proud of it and talk about it and discuss it with their friends and neighbors, if people are aware that in the United States, for instance, one in ten light bulbs is powered by a former Soviet nuclear weapon, and they think about that, or Sweden, this side of the room is powered by hydroelectric, that side of the room is powered by nuclear power. And everywhere you go, that, so it becomes part of your life and part of your consciousness, that this is just a part of our life everywhere that I think uh, what is now a seemingly very contentious issue could turn into just uh, uh, something that we're all talking about, because we have to talk about it. Energy, climate, um, human development are things we all need to talk about. Do we have any other short comments on how we talk about this issue? Or if we have uh, direct questions about exactly this, uh, from the audience, we can take them now, but the rest of the discussion we're going to save for later. No responses. Well, I, I can just make one short response. Um, uh, Robert, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think we should um, um, think it's politically incorrect to discuss this issue. I, I agree it needs to be taken out into the open beyond actually higher education institutions into the general public because they also have a, an important voice here. Um, you, you mentioned this is a sort of highly contentious, controversial problem, um, or pro not problem, but issue. Let's call it issue. Now, I would call it a wicked issue because um, um, there are clearly many different legitimate perspectives here that need to be sort of opened up and, and brought to the table here in the platform. So, more, more, it's more, more support for your perspective there. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's now move on to the second quick question. Uh, if the first one was a warm-up, maybe, <laughs> then uh, this one has more content. So, a critique against some forms of renewable energy is that we cannot control their availability. This could perhaps be solved by adapting consumer behavior and by introducing new technology. Do you believe that we can reduce this problem to an acceptable level? Yes or no? What does acceptable mean? Well, uh, that's for everyone. Well, that's the key. That's, that's the key the, thing. That's the acceptable. Acceptable is 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 replacing fossil fuels completely. Or I mean, that's right. Could be. It's not. A, it's not a process. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, like smart grids, for example, uh, things that would uh, make it feasible to actually replace. Uh, fossil fuels by renewable energy. So that's what we're talking about. I don't understand the question. I don't understand the question. So the question is basically, do you think that we actually will manage to handle renewable energy sources so that we can replace the fossil fuel with renewables? That's basically the question. We saw in the movie uh, pictures of wind winds standing still. Could this be managed? Yeah. I didn't go looking for that, but <laughs> no. Just, you can't make this stuff up. It just happened. I went out three times. Okay. Will we close the poll? Yeah. You really had enough time? It, it's moving around 50 50. Yeah, I so 50 percent of the audience <laughs> thinks that we can power the entire planet with wind and solar. Apparently, yes, more or less. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is the question. We take that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, first, first uh, follow up on this. Uh, I, I'll get back to you in the audience in a minute, but first I'll uh, ask Christina. Uh, as an expert in battery technology and uh, things like that, what, what would you say is the potential for development in energy storage uh, in the next few decades to manage these issues? I, I think I have to give you a little bit of a complex answer because 
If you look at countries where there is no developed energy grid, look at Bolivia, which is a country with just as many people as in Sweden, but the double size of its, of its area. There, you, you definitely could use solar and wind with a, a powerful energy storage device, like mini hubs, and um, batteries could be one solution because batteries have a high efficiency. Uh, if you look at Sweden, I, I would be much more doubtful that uh, we would need big battery storage and so on. If you look at large-scale storage in, in the world, 99% of all large-scale storage is pumped hydro. Half a percent is compressed air and the other half is batteries. So it, it has to do that every country has its like, own uh, energy portfolio. So you have to look at the local things to answer this question well. I think you will see more of uh, battery storage, it's coming, but if you believe that we can have batteries at 10 times higher energy content per volume than today, I'm skeptical. Perhaps you can double it compared to today, but uh, so it would mean a lot of, of materials and so on. You could increase the amount of pumped hydro, of course, also, but um, so this answer I see here is uh, quite good. I would say yes and no, and uh, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> and uh, if you think that all solar will really be in the Sahara region, and, and where we really have a lot of solar in the world, and that you think you can send it out with smart HECV cables done by ABB, yes, but then you might have a geopolitical problem. So it's, it's not so simple. It's not so simple. But yes and no. Do you, do you have any comments? Yeah. Do, do, uh, do wait, wait, and you will get the microphone so we can hear your question. Do you do you not include hydropower as renewable? Mm. Mm. That I do, and that's why my answer for Sweden would, would be that no. yes, we, we are quite well off. We have our hydropower. It's regulating already the nuclear power. You can do it. Very, very quickly, you did almost as, uh, just in a few minutes, you have yeah. regulated. But I wasn't asking you who answered the question. I was oh, asking okay. the people who asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that hydropower is sort of tapped out. I mean, yeah. we don't, don't want to, I mean, we've, I, I would, personally, I would like to see us take down a lot of hydroelectric dams, um, eventually. Mm. Not, not if they were replaced with fossil fuel plants, obviously. Um, uh, but we've pretty much tapped, we've pretty much damned every river in the world that we can. They're the only country that's really, uh, well, China's still building these colossal things, but, and Brazil is going gangbusters, damming every tributary into the Amazon and, and burning down the Amazon to grow biofuels. Those are renewable energy, that's a renewable energy portfolio, but it's not something that's environmentally friendly. Does anyone in the audience have a comment to your own answer to this question? Uh, we have one up there, I think you were first. Um, I didn't answer since I think this kind of question is actually the problem that we face uh, in uh, uh, like questions of uh, politics versus science. Uh, science doesn't want to answer these questions. They want to make them more complex and they want to give information about what kind of uh, um, uh, yeah, what kind of choice we should make about this question is uh, do you believe that we can reduce this problem to an acceptable le level? Are you for or against murder? That's, that's exactly the same kind of question, or not exactly, but um, <laughs> I'm a scientist, so I acknowledge the complexity of the question, but uh, I, I think that's really what uh, makes, are you for or against nuclear power? On what kind of, uh, like, you know, uh, what, what kind of, kind of, give me the parameters of your question. Do you know, do you think uh, nuclear power for, um, like the Far Islands is good. Like, no, why? Why? You think that Norway should have a nuclear power? Well, I don't know. Give me more information. Okay. And this is exactly why I didn't answer this question. Okay, so, that's a valid yeah. comment. Thank you. We have, uh, uh, okay. uh, we have a, uh, a comment here, and then we have uh, a comment here. I just wanted to add that. I kind of like that it got very confusing from this question because this is how confusing the energy debate is. 
because you're saying are you for against that, I'm for this, I'm against that, and in the end, nobody has a clue. So. <laughs> you know, one, thing I, one thing that I love about the people that I interviewed for this film is that, that uh, we, we, very many people in the environmental movement, I think, have confused the means with the ends. That, that, that I think the goal is more wind and more solar. Like, that's an end. And, and in fact, these are just tools. Nuclear is simply a tool, just like wind and solar is, or maybe something we haven't even thought of to solve problems. And um, we, we sort of fall into this kind of energy tribalism, where there's like one group that's in favor of solar, and one people are working on batteries, and that's the solution. Or not, I'm not, but <laughs> people get I these things. Exactly like mean. this is the one you fix, know, and I, I don't think that I I'm think promoting I'm, nuclear as a I fix. think I'm allowed to coordinate this stand up because I'm not a solar or a hydropower or a marine current power or windmill person. I'm a storage person. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I was quite astonished that there's still a dispute about this, at least about Germany, and I'm quite surprised that Germany was not even mentioned in this whole movie. In Germany there is the consensus that until 2050 we can, we can, if we have the political will, power pull Germany with 100% renewable energy. Okay. And there have been numerous studies by different universities by different institutes like the University of Kassel or the Fraunhofer Institute and they even have a homepage where they list all the lies by the nuclear and fossil fuel lobby and how to debunk them. And it's quite astonishing when you make a film and you don't look at these pages and do not tackle these very strong arguments but when you only tackle, I would say, the worst arguments. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, uh, can I'm I not... respond? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll just say that uh, this sounds like a very much larger question than uh, than the one that we're talking about now. So maybe we can uh, postpone part of this discussion. I think it's actually gets the argument right on the head. I think this is exactly your what you said is exactly on point to this question. Okay, so let's just uh... Germany. It's very interesting what's going on in Germany, um, and it merits a film in itself. I think Germany has half the world's supply of solar PV. Um, they've invested around 130 billion euros or so in their solar energy uh, development. And they currently get, on an annualized basis, 5% of their electricity from solar, which is remarkable. Still leaves 95% coming from other sources. They have about 7% wind. That's great, so that's 12% going for, coming from wind and solar. Um, they are the only country in Western Europe, I think maybe perhaps all of Europe, that's still building coal plants. 52% of their energy comes from coal. They're burning the dirtiest coal on the planet, lignite coal, and their CO2 emissions are going up. So we'll see what happens. But my, my criticism, I, I, I applaud what they're trying to do, and, and make, if it works, that's great. But my criticism of the Greens in Germany is that they went after nuclear first. They used their uh, enormous investment in wind and solar uh, to displace nuclear first and then coal. And they haven't shut, they're still building coal plants. I would have respected them if they said, let's ramp up wind and solar and we'll start phasing out our coal plants. Once we've phased out our coal plants and we can continue ramping up wind and solar, then we'll start ratcheting down our nuclear plants and we'll see where it goes. But I think what they betrayed is their true agenda which is an anti-nuclear agenda. And I predict that they will never get any further than simply shutting down and replacing their nuclear plants. I don't think they have any further agenda regarding climate uh, beyond that. And we'll see what happens. They're already in the news, I think just yesterday, they've already, uh, 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 they're coming to an agreement to uh, uh, rat ratchet down the subsidies for wind and solar and to, to stop, they're not going to go to 100%, they've already looked, they're already, they've already acknowledged that, that they can't get there. Um, so, like I say, we'll see what happens. You've got France, France and Sweden are the only two countries in the world that have ever decarbonized their electric grids. Both countries did so with a massive ramp up of the nuclear energy. Um, but we'll see. 
You've got Germany doing one thing, you've got France and Sweden doing another thing. Right now, France has the lowest electricity in Europe, the lowest electricity costs in Europe, cleanest air in the industrialized world. Germany is building more coal plants and has the highest electricity costs in all of Europe. Uh, if that changes, we'll see what happens. But I think Germany is actually not an example to the world right now. It may become one, but it is not yet. I can just say why that happened. Um, so, uh, why did a nuclear power uh, become phased out earlier than coal power? The reason is, uh, it was the green, red, so socialist green government that f uh, started phasing out um, nuclear energy and it was then taken back by the conservative government and then uh, Fukushima happened and everything was again uh, reverted. But the um, social democrats uh, are very close to coal power, so the Greens could only reach phasing out nuclear power, but they couldn't reach, the, they could not tell their uh, coalition partner, the, the Social Democrats, to phase out coal as well, because the Social Democrats and coal are very close. Uh, to you them. know what, the, Germany opened up the largest coal plant in all of Europe, it's the single largest source of CO2 in the entire European Union, and not a single Green showed up to protest it. Not one. It's not one. Right? It's in the news. In fact, when they opened it, they hailed it as an environmental achievement, because uh, I don't know how they did that, but they, that, <laughs> they did. That was part of the speech when they opened it. I think it's in us. You, you already have your comment card. Okay. So, um, I think we'll move uh, to the next clicker question, <laughs> which is also a little bit just to provoke, perhaps. Uh, so, what is your opinion now about nuclear power? <laughs> One is we should pursue nuclear energy, even if we risk accidents. Two is we should use nuclear power as a bridge technology now and focus on reducing the use of fossil fuel and in the future aim for renewable. Third is we should sh shut down all nuclear power as soon as possible even if we cannot replace it with renewable. So, uh, just answer this now and we'll take the discussion. Uh, Okay, maybe this is saying something about the uh, audience. Okay, we can close the poll. You can close the poll. And uh, now we see that um, number two. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, the alternative uh, with no drawbacks, <laughs> as it's stated on the linear formulation, get the most. Uh, uh, goes, get the most clicks, uh, which might not be so surprising, or uh, what do you say? Now, um, actually, do uh, you have a comment before? Yeah. Can, I, can I just reflect on that result? Sure. Um, as you hear from my accent, I'm an Australian, I'm not Swedish, but I do know a bit about it in Swedish environmental history. And my understanding was there was a referendum in Sweden many years ago in terms of nuclear energy. And apparently the people said no, but the government went ahead anyway. And um, as, you, as you say now, it's, it's one of the sort of cleanest countries in the world using a, a sort of carbon emissions environmental perspective. Um, so I, I, think, I think that result's interesting just to sort of just, once you have nuclear power, even if people don't appreciate it or don't want it, it's probably going to be very difficult to get rid of it. That's, that's, a, that's a reflection. Okay, I, I, I believe there is a, a picture that you would want to show now. This is, uh, if you want to explain what it is, perhaps? It is a yearly poll um, on the, what, people think, what people in Sweden think about nuclear power that is run every year. And this was in today, so this is just a few hours fresh. Okay, so... Uh, most people think we should continue to use nuclear power uh, and construct new or continue to use only the ones that we already have. 
that's number one and two. So now. No, the referendum was not done at the university, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the referendum was the whole population. It was 1980. And it was a big discussion. You had three options. It was no, or it was no, but later. Three options. It was very clever. It was very clever. It was three options, yeah. And then it was yes, yes. And there were big debates, it was very emotional, and we discussed the question of carbon, um, having uh, carbon uh, or coal, coal plants instead, and we all already then discussed the, the problems with, with coal plants and the emissions you had, and you have the acidic rain and all that. Uh, we were very early in discussing these problems already then, and I was 20 years, it was my first election. It was extremely interesting. <laughs> if you're already 100% clean energy, you already got rid of all your fossil fuel plants, what this makes perfect sense. Why build? Why not just stick with what you have? Power plants. Power plants, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, still got the transportation sector, sure. Yes. But that's the world over, we haven't solved that. This is where you come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, if, if you would like to just say something short, we'll continue next. <laughs> uh, very shortly, uh, in the new me, you argue that renewables will not be able to meet our demands. Uh, do, you, do you have any other comment on that before? Well, look, the, the, one, of, one, of the, one of the, I would say two, two key assumptions that the environmental movement has had from day one uh, are, are these. One is that um, the world was going to be able to reduce overall energy demand through energy efficiency. And the only time that we have uh, overall energy demand has ever gone down has been in, in times of recession. Um, so uh, even in the developed countries over the, the recent decades where we've gone uh, uh, put a lot of effort into energy efficiency and at the same time we've outsourced a great deal of our manufacturing base to China, which should have also reduced energy demand. You know, their CO2 emissions are actually ours. Um, um, uh, we've still seen a, a, a moderate, moderate increase um, uh, in, in energy, but what we didn't take into account was the, the, the explosion in energy demand around the world because of the developing world. And right now, we are adding the energy equivalent of another Brazil to the planet every year. That's just a gargantuan increase in energy that needs to be filled, and, and that, that won't go on forever. But uh, as you pointed out, we've got two billion people in the world who don't have any electricity at all, another two billion who don't have enough, and we've got another two billion people coming. So that's going to keep going for quite some time. Um, the, uh, and the other key assumption that we had was that as you, uh, that the, the use of human, if you give people more energy, they will, they will do more damage. It will enable them to do more damage to the planet. And therefore, if we could restrain our use of energy by tying us to the wind and the natural force of the wind and the sun, that would restrain human imposition onto the natural world. That has also turned out to be actually false. And that what we find around the world is where you have societies that have more energy, they have lower birth rates, birth population being the key issue here. You also have people rise, lift up into the middle class, and they become better environmental stewards. So one of the problems in China right now, middle class is simply not tolerating the pollution problems there. So um, these are two key assumptions that we had wrong. Okay. So uh, this is where we leave uh, over to you. Do you uh, feel comfortable now? Uh, Neil Paul, uh, how do you uh, view this further development of nuclear energy or uh, all the alternatives? From a sustainable uh, development perspective, how would you attack this problem or frame it? Um, I think I think I um, asked if it was possible to show a slide. Is that yeah, right? sure. Um, we have prepared it here. I hope it's the right one. Uh, yes, it is. I think there were two slides, but I can use this slide. Um, towards the end of the movie, I think um, one of the conclusions was that we could. Um, uh, maintain our high energy resource intense lives without killing the climate. And I'm um, actually, as someone working with sustainable development, that's probably the statement I am, um, I find most provocative, actually. Um, I think, I think um, I'd like to deconstruct um, what 
and environment, environmentalists actually mean. So I think we've been talking very much about um, uh, environment from an energy perspective. And energy is just one very small part of the environment. Um, this, this, the slide that I meant to show actually was um, something that Rockstrom and, and others have been working on. He's talked about planetary boundaries. Um, and although I, I, th I think that's provocative in itself, it's very, very useful as a metaphor. To think about our operating space, as they call it, um, those boundaries that we actually need to live within as society and um, seeing our universe bounded by different environmental thresholds. Um, one of those thresholds, of course, is our energy consumption, as you talk about. And here, we, here we have something here called universal clean, clean energy in, in number four, and that's something clearly that is important for us to sort of take on board and, and consider. Um, but we need to think about what does clean really mean? Does clean just mean from a carbon emissions perspective? Um, or does clean mean something actually quite different? Does that mean from a food security perspective? Does it mean something in terms of nutrient enrichment? And so on. All those sort of uh, environmental considerations that are a result of our high energy resource intensive lives. Um, so I, I think uh, this idea that we can simply um, ramp up our energy consumption um, through the provision of nuclear energy is actually uh, something we call a Robin Peter to pay Paul syndrome. Whilst uh, we're, we're, um, we're paying or we're, we're actually sort of pre preserving the environment from a carbon emissions perspective, we're probably robbing other environmental services in terms of society. But this so, imagines there's a choice. I mean, that globe that lights up in the, in the end of the film uh, I think, you know, 30 years ago you could have made the argument that that's not a good thing and that nuclear energy is, would, would do that um, and that fossil fuels wouldn't because we thought we were running out of fossil fuels. One of the great tragedies, we, we spent the last several decades, what is that? Somebody's <laughs> uh, We spent the last several decades putting so much of our uh, technological prowess and, and investments and massive subsidies into extracting ever more quantities of fossil fuels. So we're not running out of fossil fuels like we thought we were. Fossil fuels remain very cheap. That planet that lights up in the end will be powered by fossil fuels. The world, the developing world is lifting itself out of poverty, not by our largesse. They're doing it on their own. By extracting more fossil fuels. I think. I think what we're doing. So that's the problem. Well, I think. What, I think we may be a sort of need to sort of uh, rethink the issue here a little bit. I mean, I think the issue could be um, energy provision, or the issue could be maybe our resource-intensive lives, um, and the fact that it's not all of us that have these resource-intensive lives. That there are many people on the globe that don't have resource-intensive lives, and I think. I think this is quite useful to actually critique. Um, let's say um, provision of energy from a nuclear energy perspective um, versus other energy perspectives, because we can we can use it as a, use it use it as a checklist, in a sense. Well, this th these are the new sustainable development goals that are, are proposed for 2015. We've had the Millennium Development Goals, and now that these new sustainable development goals, and that they're not going to be just applied within developing countries but they'll be actually applied globally. And um, I think one needs to think very carefully about issues that go beyond energy when you think about energy provision. We need to think about equity issues, we need to think about power issues, we need to think about poverty, um, we need to think about gender issues. And it's quite easy when we stay within our own little disciplinary boxes just to sort of optimise around energy and energy mm -hmm. provision without actually unpacking those boxes. And They're all related there. I mean, gender issues. So one thing that can lift women out of the drudgery of housework, for instance, which is predominant around the world, is, you know, washing machines. Simple, simple things like washing machines and refrigeration, hospitalization. Uh, I mean, you know, energy is the key thing that allows people to, to, to even have the kind of conversation that we're having here, you know? Um, so many people around the world, I'm sure you've traveled in the developing world, I mean, they are energy poor. 
Their, their daily existence is, is a life of, of drudgery and a lack of uh, energy resources. Well, quite certainly our resources could sustain an energy rich lifestyle for the world. For the world. There, are, there are other, sorry? We have, there are other resources. We have more than just um, energy in the world. We have a whole set of other natural resources. By having an energy rich life, we're going to be actually undermining those resources. Like, so, for yeah. example, well, I mean, the production of all those washing machines, let's say that we have the assumption that we're all going to have washing machines in the world and we're going to all um, live the same sort of lifestyle that you're living in and enjoying today. You can't decide that for the, you can't decide that for the five billion people who want to live like we do. But we can perhaps decide it for ourselves. As you say, we've just moved. Does anybody want to turn in their iPhone today to save the planet? Not one person. <laughs> And this is obviously a very difficult uh, kind of uh, problem. Well, um, I think that we now have a few extra minutes added on because we had problems in the, uh, with, with the sound in the beginning. So we have uh, now time for questions, more questions from the audience. We already have like three, four, five. Uh, well, we start here. Uh, I would like to ask a question to our nuclear physicist here. Um, so, I'm going to ask you about uh, if nuclear energy is sustainable or not sustainable, if you could, can call nuclear energy sustainable, uh, would available on it. So, for how long could you power the entire world on fourth generation nuclear power? Well, how you long? mean with ura natural uranium in the Earth? Yes. Theoretically, for as long as we like. Millions of years? Yes. I mean... You have it. You mean and there is enough, enough yes. of uranium? The football field of, of nuclear waste that's portrayed in the film in the United States could power everything in the United States, including the transportation sector, at today's level for 1,000 years. Just that. Yeah, and we have about the same amount of, of waste in Sweden. Like the, and then you can go to thorium and it's, you know, there's just an abundance. Like there's some... Place like one little hill in Norway, I heard that could, has enough thorium to power the entire planet for like 10,000 years or something. It's crazy. Um, is that a, it's, um, it's, it's a it's a it's a extractive resource. It's limited, but it's so unlimited it's beyond human civilization. You know, reach to even imagine. So I think perhaps you here was the next one. Thank you. Uh, I recall a TED talk where he talked about levers of different sizes where we pull on uh, like energy efficiency or nuclear power and if we don't like one to, to pull on one level uh, we have to pull harder on the other level, levers. <coughs> uh, so people might dislike pulling on uh, like public transportation because it's a lifestyle change, change on iPhones for example. Uh, considering this, why do you think many environmentalists are against nuclear power when it's a feasible alternative to coal power, coal power and stuff like that? Why do I think this? Yeah. All, all well, I mean, I, I, I said it in the beginning, I think there's a, I think the green movement that grew out of the 60s and 70s and most of the big environmental groups were formed in that era, um, conflated nuclear power with nuclear weapons. One of the founding tenets of, the, of today's environmental movement is, anti, is an anti-nuclear perspective. And I think there's just a carryover of that into a very different era that we live in now. And young people, I find taking the film around, young people who grew up where the existential threat that they've grown up with is, is climate change and not you know, a nuclear attack from the Soviet Union have a very different perspective. Thank you, Ramos. Well, I would say that the environmental movement has opposed nuclear power. Actually, I would say that nuclear power caused the environmental movement as we know it today. The people participating in the Manhattan Project were the prime pioneers of pacifism and environmentalism in the 1950s. So to say that nuclear power is something um, on the other side of the spectrum, is in, I don't think that's a very informed picture of the political spectrum. And actually, what we're talking about here is not the green movement or the Grönland to begin with. It's actually a blue movement, which is a climate movement. And what we're trying to combat is the increased emissions of carbon dioxide and if we're built willing to accept any political measures to do that then by all means you can do that but then we should be discussing like fascism because 
what we're trying to find here is a solution which is also ethical, which can sustain the society which we want to have. But they're not opposed at all. And and if we was if we are to preserve anything of Pandora's promise, um, and I mean if we talk about the allegory of the box, which at the bottom of the box lies hope, after in and um, after releasing all the terrors of the world, Pandora finds hope. Then we should stop shouting and start talking. And and that's actually the main uh, benefit of a movie like this because you can have environmentalists, climate movement um, participants, and people uh, working with uh, atomic energy at the same table and try to discuss the solutions. Um, but we cannot say in one breath then that nuclear power is sustainable. Actually, uh, nuclear power is in itself an uncertain technology. But as long as we acknowledge that fact, we can have an informed discussion. It's uncertain, but it's a risk. Um, it's a difference between a technology which is at risk. I mean, we can, cal we can calculate how many people will die in traffic every year, but we cannot calculate how many Fukushimas we will have. So if we're willing to accept Fukushimas happening every once in a while, then we can have that type of solution. But it's a, it's a new type of society. It's a society in which we assume that accidents are normal. Yeah. And I think that's very nice that you point that out, because this is actually the, uh, the thing we included in the first question here. That you have to be, you have, you have to acknowledge that accidents can happen. You can't have nuclear power and be safe from accidents. They can happen. But we can make nuclear power safer, we can make it better, we can learn. We can never engineer away the possibility of an accident. So when you think about future uh, energy systems, I mean, you really need to weigh the pros and cons of, of more than try to assemble it. You, you have to weigh. The, I mean, you have to weigh the risk. It's very easy to go down to pick almost any energy source and make a long list of all the things you don't like about it. And say, well, I'm going to knock that out of the way. But you can do that with any energy source. I mean, uh, even even uh, solar power, as we pointed out in the film. Believe it or not, it's kind of shocking to me. But more people die per terawatt hour produced per unit of energy produced from solar than from nuclear. It's shocking, but statistically true. Um, so everything has, its, everything has its risks and every thing has its drawbacks. The biggest risk of all is committing yourself to an energy source that doesn't solve the immediate problem that we face. That we have to solve, our generation has to solve this problem. We can't kick the can down the road any longer. I think we have a direct comment on that here, uh, the man with the glasses. Yeah, sure. Would you please explain that figure? Oh, sorry. Uh, would you please explain that figure? That where you talk about the solar and the, the deaths in solar? Yeah, well, uh, 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 there's, a, there's a study done, peer-reviewed study. It's on our website. You can look at it. Um, it's widely respected among the scientific community that, uh, that, that looked at the, the, the deaths per unit of energy produced from each energy source. So do you know what, you, is that what the confusion is? No, how can you die? From solar. Oh, oh, how can you die from solar? Well, it's not a lot of people. It's not a lot of people, but the, 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 the manufacturing of solar panels is incredibly toxic. Rare earth metals in the mining, the toxic materials that go into the mining. And, and rare earth metals. There's not a single solar technology which uses rare earth metals. Well, that's, the that's, that's always the confusion. There's no rare earth methods in solar. Okay. No, there are rare That's methods in it. Yes. Okay. Rare. Rare. Oh, sorry. Terminology. And then, I believe it or not, there are people who, a, a fair number of people, fall off the roofs installing them. I know that seems funny, but it's actually because solar produces so little energy globally, the number of people is less than the number of people who've died from nuclear power accidents because nuclear power produces an extraordinary amount of energy. Yeah, I know you're shaking your head. But it, you know, this is according to World Health Organization statistics, you know, about uh, which gets back to the whole argument about Chernobyl and we talked about Fukushima. Nobody has died at Fukushima or even gotten sick except for two guys that got hit by a crane, I think, that fell. Yeah. So still, nobody's died, and according to the World Health Organization, there'll never be any statistical. You'll never see it. If there is any, if there's any epidemiological uh, increase in cancer, you'll never see it. According to them. I haven't done my own studies, I'm just simply reporting what they say. 
Um, I see one hand now, but I, I think you were first, actually, up there in the pattern. Uh, my name is Simon Lovsson, I'm a PhD student in Global Energy Systems here at Uppsala. Um, and I kind of have an uh, interesting movie. I think you lifted a lot of important topics, but I also think that you missed quite a few important ones too. You point out, sure, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, but I mean, you point out a lot of drawbacks with renewables like wind and solar and how they are not going to be able to fill the gap. But you somehow automatically assume that nuclear can. I think there's a lot of limits to how fast nuclear could grow as well. And just, uh, I, I reacted to the same thing that Neil did about you ended the movie with saying that we can have a 10 billion people world uh, living a resource intensive lives and there are a lot of other resource limits uh, and it's I think it's just kind of a, uh, a similar view you present that the people who believe in wind and solar that we can have nuclear instead of still believing in a technology coming to save us making us able to live the same lives as we do today without changing anything uh, but just we haven't got a nuclear instead of wind and solar uh, and I just think it's I, 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 I realize I have to simplify things but I think you're like not acknowledging the uh, how many nuclear power plants you would have to build to reach this level. I don't think that's possible. Either, uh, well, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm, all, I'm not saying that we will solve the problem. I'm saying that there is no way to solve the problem without it. There's a narrow path through the woods here. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. With, and you're going to need uh, everything. Everything to th we're going to have to throw everything we have at this problem in order to solve it. And it, for us to say at this particular juncture that. Um, that we're going to put aside one extraordinarily promising technology um, because of ideological reasons or whatever, uh, and, and, and run the very serious risk of, of moving ahead without that technology and having, having these other technologies fail to solve the problem, that that's a risk. I think we need to put everything on the table. And in terms of the time frame, it should be remembered, I mean, Sweden has done it. Uh, Sweden who did it 50% hybrid, but France did, it was 80% nuclear, they did it in 20 years. And that is the time frame that, that, according to the climate scientists, that's kind of what we got to, to solve this problem. So it can be done, but we've got we've to get to work and we've got to start mass producing these things the way we mass produce commercial jet aircraft, for instance. And that's the way, to, that's the way you can roll this out. I, I think we will have um, time for one more question, and I actually think the guy in the blue shirt was the first. Uh, and then I hope you will stay afterwards, because uh, even if uh, Robert Stone has to leave us, the rest of the panel will stay here and we'll continue the conversation uh, after. Hey, so a lot of discussion I have with friends often stop with, can we believe this? And after seeing this movie, I will probably, probably discuss this. And I'd like to know where to find the details of every data you have presented in this movie. Can I trust that I find it on the web page? Well, first of all, let me say that the film will be available on iTunes on December 10th. So if you want to share, share it with your friends, that's where you can get the film. Um, there's a lot of information on the website, but if you're really interested, you know, don't trust me. Trust the, if you go to the website and, 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 and you can see, there'll be hyperlinks. There's a, there's a whole Q&A with me where everything that I say responding are hyperlinks to the raw data that's, that the information in the film is based on. Um, so, you know, don't trust, if you have questions, you know, about, Chernobyl or some of the, you know, the, 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 the more contentious things, you know, go to the source, go to the data, do your own research. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I think we have to now end this part of uh, the evening where the panel is taking questions. But as I said, you're all welcome to stay for sandwiches. And before you leave, Robert, I would like to give you a small gift from oh. the university. Just a symbol, symbolic thing to thank you for actually taking the time to participate in, in this little conversation here. So thanks a lot and uh, please thank the panel.
get into fuel recycling, you don't need to mine at all. So, yeah.